Okay, guys. Uh, nice to have you here. So uh, we'll talk uh, a lot of about numbers, but uh, I'll uh, try to do my best uh, to make it enjoyable. Uh, so uh, uh, Mark started to talk about it, but I'll add a few words about uh, why you should care about this uh, whole uh, thing of uh, quantized neural nets. Why quantize? How to quantize? What quantization at all? And uh, then we'll talk about uh, optimization in general and what uh, we have done about it. And then we'll talk, uh, of course, about uh, some uh, the, of the novelties that we brought here. So why should you care? So the first reason is practical. Everybody is doing it, right? Every big uh, vendor has some uh, offering uh, in terms of, or working on an offering in terms of both uh, hardware for inference of uh, deep networks and software to quantize uh, and prepare the nets. Um, and the, of course, uh, mo most of these and uh, mo most of these uh, support a few data types, but the in but the integer eight bit is always always one of them because it's a kind of the standard. And the the big four, okay, Google and Apple and Microsoft, and the, even Facebook are also doing it. Uh, so fa Facebook, for example, they Currently, according to what I know, they don't, uh, uh, they're not working on chip, but uh, they are working on the uh, optimization uh, packages. And uh, of course, Google is working also on hardware. So, it, uh, so just for an example, Google, of course, uh, have their uh, uh, TPU uh, chip and uh, hardware, which is a big competitor to NVIDIA. But in the last year, they announced the Edge TPU. And it supports, it actually doesn't support floating point at all. It supports just uh, int 8 as uh, um, the main data type with uh, some backup uh, to int 16. Uh, Microsoft has some special approach with floating point, but a low bit floating point, and etc. It's a whole uh, bustling field. Uh, and, but the, there is another reason, which is conceptual, about why. Uh, and that's, that's just my opinion, but uh, eventually deep learning is about feeding a function, at least the, in the supervised sense, uh, out of some, uh, some uh, parameterized family uh, of uh, functions, which is, uh, of course, uh, very, very wi wide and rich, parameterized by millions of parameters, but it is also uh, constrained. So uh, it's weird to think about it about constraints when you have millions of parameters, but in fact, CNN, like convolutional neural networks, are uh, constrained in the sense that uh, every output in a feature map depends only on its neighbors uh, in the preceding layer, uh, right? Um, so, uh, and it works like this because of reasons of uh, generalization, but also uh, because of practicality, both training uh, and inference. So. Uh, you look for a function that is a good uh, fit, but it's also runnable uh, in practice. And when you look at it like this, uh, you see that uh, going to low numerical precision is j just another step, uh, uh, another kind of uh, adding a constraint to the family, like reducing the family of functions that we are searching on to a subset. Uh, when uh, each of the parameters, we look for a uh, best value for it inside a smaller space of uh, 2 to the power of 8 instead of power of 32. Okay, so just a little bit of hand waving. Uh, so we started to talk about why quantize, but let's make it uh, more concrete. So, uh, uh, so uh, th these are like costs in uh, space on chip and the uh, power for different operations. And you can see that the uh, 32-bit operations are much more costly than 8-bit, and floating point is more costly than integer, which is uh, kind of obvious, but the differences are uh, serious. And uh, also, what's uh, sometimes surprising to newcomers is that uh, moving the data around is uh, actually the most expensive part, more than the arithmetic operations. You can see it here, especially if you, 
if you sp need to spill out to less local memories and physically uh, remote memories, the uh, DRAM, etc. So uh, that's a, a big reason. Uh, but uh, you see, these are pico joules, right? It's very small, but of course, we all know that it's uh, multiplied by uh, billions of operations uh, per second, which bring us to order of uh, uh, watts. Um, and of course, it depends on the network. So uh, this is kind of a recent roundup of different image net classifiers, which is a, like a classic benchmark. Um, you have uh, on the left side, you have um, um, like low end networks, which are specifically designed for mobile, less parameters and operations, but also more efficient. Um, but in uh, like in automotive applications, it's more probable that the high-end networks will be run, which maybe add uh, just a little bit in accuracy, but uh, it's a car, right? You want to uh, do your best uh, to add as much safety as you can, so you'll do the extra effort and uh, uh, bring more parameters uh, and operations. Uh, so, uh, to make it uh, even more concrete, uh, what's, again, what's a neural network? So eventually it's a computational graph. You have, uh, ignore the sigma, please. So uh, you have the uh, data flowing over the edges and nodes are, of course, the computational uh, uh, operations. And uh, eventually this ha has to be mapped to hardware. It may be a dynamical mapping if you just execute it on a, a plain, simple CPU, but anyways, it it must be mapped in some way, and uh, every edge uh, uh, eventually is uh, some transfer of data, weight. Uh, it incurs some storage, even if temporary, in uh, very close memories. And uh, of course, uh, there is the compute. So in uh, this uh, framework of thought, um, we can uh, see easily the advantage of uh, going to low bits. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, everything in the pipeline becomes slimmer, have less bits, so you have less transfers, less storage, and less compute, um, which is so flexible, it doesn't has to be exactly the same uh, encoding. Uh, but, so, uh, if you remember the price tags, it uh, reduces the price tag uh, in terms of for silicon, if you design new hardware, and in any case, uh, in terms of uh, the power. But uh, what's more interesting that sometimes, uh, sometimes it enables uh, qualitatively different uh, design choices, which lead to order of magnitudes increase in efficiency. So, uh, you know, when you have uh, less stuff to move, it's obvious you'll need uh, less uh, fuel uh, to drive. But uh, sometimes you can make the switch from driving a truck to driving a car because you have um, enough space in the car for your stuff. So, uh, and that, that's exactly what happened with the, in many domains, but uh, especially in deep learning, uh, when uh, uh, incremental quantitative changes in the GPU ability ev eventually crossed some threshold and there was an explosion uh, in the abilities of uh, deep learning, right? So quantitative became qualitative. That's an important point. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, I hope you are convinced that uh, it's important. I see everybody still here. Uh, so, uh, so what quantization is all about? Um, we'll talk about a bit about uh, digital signals, and uh, I, I guess many of you uh, know this by heart. So you'll need to excuse me. Um, uh, oh, so, of course, s digital signal is something that is discretized on both uh, the time axis or special axis, in case of images, and uh, on the value axis. So, sampling on x axis is sampling, and discretization on y axis here is quantization. That's what we are talking about. Uh, in neural net, so uh, everybody knows what's the signal in uh, audio and or in image, right? We have the pixels, three channels in each pixel. So uh, what are the signals that we are talking about in uh, 
neural net quantization. So, uh, so th that's the neural net, right? In uh, each layer, we have the inputs, the outputs, and the weights that uh, are constants used in the computation. Everything of this uh, can be looked upon as a single, as a signal, uh, which is digital. You need to quantize it. Um, uh, the input is actually the image that that I mentioned, uh, which is kind of feature map with the three features. And uh, after uh, some layers, you have feature maps, which are have also special dimensions, like uh, image, but uh, also a larger dimension of features or channels. Of course, uh, what I just said, uh, it's about the convolutional neural nets, and there are other kinds. But uh, as Avi mentioned, uh, this is the uh, central thing that uh, uh, we are focusing on now. OK, so uh, let's quantize the signal. Here it's already quantized. So uh, uniform quantization, uh, obviously, is applying a staircase function uh, to the signal. And uh, if I give it uh, more bits, then uh, the staircase is uh, smoother. And uh, the quantization error, or quantization noise, which is the difference between the original and quantized signal, depicted here in uh, uh, green, is smaller as, uh, as you give more bits. Uh, you can also quantize in a non-uniform fashion. Uh, so the staircase is... Uh, um, Non-uniform, the steps are bigger uh, in, diff in other parts. So uh, one way to implement it is to pass the signal through some uh, nonlinear transformation, then a uniform quantization, and transform again. Com so some call it compending, like compression expanding. Uh, and uh, okay, so uh, eventually the main. Uh, the main conflict of, of, uh, in quantization is always between the dynamic range and the precision. So when you make the dynamic range large, then your beans are larger and the precision is smaller. And uh, it may sound obvious, but uh, actually there is a lot uh, to it. So let's look. Uh, let's take a deeper look. So uh, let's take a toy example of a very beautiful uniformly distributed signal, which we want to quantize to uh, four bits. Uh, and of course, that's uh, the perfect case. Uh, all of the beans are equally used. And we look at the histogram. Uh, then, of course, uh, the distribution of the signal is uh, uniform uh, in this uh, range of minus eight to eight distribution uh, of uh, uh, quantization noise and also uniform uh, between plus and minus uh, uh, 0.5, which is usually what happens if the step is uh, uh, one. And uh, the ratio of uh, the signal to the noise is uh, two to, to the power of uh, bits. And the uh, life is beautiful. Uh, if uh, our signal is uh, non-uniformly distributed, then uniform quantization is <coughs> not so optimal. And the SQNR, the ratio of the signal to noise magnitude that I mentioned, um, can go down uh, even close to zero. When uh, most, uh, for so for example, in this toy example, uh, most uh, typical values of the signal are on the order of uh, uh, of the bin of the quantization bin, so the typical most of the signal is on, on the order of the noise. Another way to say that SQNR goes to zero. So uh, every time we double the dynamic range uh, for a reason or for a bad reason, we lose uh, one bit of precision, and uh, then we suddenly quantize in seven bits instead of the eight bits that we wanted. Uh, it can happen. Uh, uh, because of uh, different reasons that uh, you see here. And uh, we'll see every one of them uh, come back in the context of neural networks. Uh, so, uh, so actually, this example is important. You can see the two colors here, the two channels that, let's say, for some technical reasons, we need to uh, use uh, the same encoding for them, so the same parameters of the quantization. And uh, 
Uh, you can see that uh, the dynamic range is given by the larger orange signal, uh, which we need to accommodate, and then the blue suffers because uh, it's uh, much smaller, so it doesn't get enough bits. So in quantization, we don't say sharing is caring. <laughs> it doesn't hold here. In fact, we say uh, uh, good fences make good neighbors. All right. So uh, when we when you share uh, the dynamic range between different channels or between strong and weak signals, the precision suffers. And uh, this uh, gap is important, right? So the pain comes uh, from uh, these uh, gaps uh, between the effective dynamic range of the signal and the one that we use for quantization. We use to compute the bins, uh, divide the range into two two point bits bin. So, uh, and actually that happens a lot in uh, neural networks. So if you look at typical distributions of both activations and weights, you see a lot of nonlinearity, a uh, lot uniformity, you see some uh, bell-like curves, but also uh, more complex features. Uh, so, now we understand uh, some better, uh, a little bit better about uh, this conflict. So what, so what can be done? How can we make advance? So this left uh, hand guy, we can uh, ask him uh, how many of these uh, rare uh, and uh, high samples that necessitate wide dynamic range that he has actually need. Maybe he can give up on some of them. We can reduce uh, the dynamic range by giving them up, clipping, and uh, incurring some clipping error, but improving our usual quantization uh, error, rounding error. And uh, the right-hand guy, we also can discuss uh, some something with him. We can ask him about whether uh, actually all of uh, the small values also uh, are all of them created equal. Is the SQNR a good metric at all for is it the, the metric that we want to optimize? And uh, actually, the m most interesting uh, question uh, is uh, to what is the downstream processing sensitive? So eventually, the, the one who needs to decide is the consumer of the signal. So uh, for example, in uh, multimedia, uh, images, uh, audio, etc., the consumers are our eyes and ears. And uh, there was very, very extensive research into sensitivities uh, of, the, uh, of them, and uh, it's constantly used in, uh, across uh, all uh, multimedia technology. So for example, when uh, any camera that you use in code uh, uh, RGB, they use uh, non-uniform quantization, which gives more bits to the small values, to the uh, weak signals, because that's what our eyes are sensitive to. And that's the gamma correction that you see on your monitor. Um, and uh, in the context of neural networks, when our uh, signal is uh, uh, some interlayer data, or maybe in the first layer it's the actual image, the same image that our eyes consume, uh, it's an interesting question to ask to what, is, to what errors is the network most sensitive? And, and it's an absolutely open question. There is no, uh, uh, no concrete... Uh, answers to this one, so interesting field of research. Um, and uh, that, so that's one, uh, one direction that I would like you to remember. And uh, another one is, uh, is uh, that, uh, uh, so again, uh, another way to go about it is to uh, try to mitigate this gap between weak and strong signals and uh, to uh, find some way to amplify the weak and compress the strong signals. So let's like remember this as a mantra for uh, bringing peace into this uh, conflict, right? <laughs> um, uh, so uh, just a recap of uh, all of this hand waving. Uh, dynamic range defines the whole quantization <coughs> process. That's the uh, central issue, sharing uh, dynamic range with signals is no fun, especially if they're stronger than you. And uh, peace and love. Uh, so, uh, okay, so let's talk a bit more concretely about uh, neural net quantization. 
Um, so uh, all of these are signals, and we to quantize them, we need to define the dynamic range for all of them. So we need to find the dynamic range for uh, this data, the input to this layer, and uh, for the weight, and for the output data, which is the output data of the first layer and the input data to the next one. Uh, we need to find the dynamic range for all of them. For weights, it's uh, kind of easy because you have the values, so uh, you can see which are the biggest ones. Maybe you don't need the, the biggest one, you can give up a bit. Uh, um, but anyways, it's static. Uh, for, uh, for the activations, we don't have the values up front. If we just uh, downloaded the uh, pre-trained network from the internet, we need to uh, turn on some images. So we put, push some images uh, down the network, uh, run the computation, then sample what values came about to uh, find from these statistics what range uh, is needed to be used. Uh, and then we are casting. So we talked about it, but just to make it uh, perfectly clear, let's say we found, uh, let's say we found a range that we like, uh, R mean to R max, and then any values that we need to quantize, we cast around them to the nearest uh, uh, bin edge, nearest round number, and uh, the values that are outside of this range, we clamp them. So in this case, we clamp something that was about the R max. Okay, and hopefully, uh, hopefully what happens is that this uh, dynamic range that you decided upon is good for uh, most of the signals and bad for very rare and irrelevant values. And uh, because of this picture uh, uh, presents an asymmetric case of unsigned uh, integer, usually that's what's used for uh, activations, the data that flows between layers in the network. Um, and for the weights, what's usually used is uh, the symmetric uh, quantization to uh, int 8. And uh, you'll excuse me for, uh, for, an, for another picture, it's just uh, what I found, but uh, the principle is exactly the same. Uh, what's different here is uh, that uh, uh, in the symmetric case and in the weight case, finding the dynamic range is easier, just go about, uh, uh, find the max uh, absolute weight in twice this value is the range that you want to quantize into those 255 values that 8 bits per you. This is uh, one layer, a convolution for example, we have the input, we have the weights, they are used to compute uh, some intermediate representation and then a nonlinear activation acts on this and the output data is the same as input data for the next layer and uh, on all of these stages the two inputs to the computation and the one output will re replace uh, the, uh, the original high precision floating point 32 bit numbers by 8 bit quantized numbers. Uh, is that all? Uh, so uh, if you remember the first slide, a lot of players do this and uh, say that they use 8 bit quantization. But in fact, um, there are many, many details that are uh, omitted here in uh, this simple picture, and they can be uh, completed in very different ways. So, for example, um, one thing that you can see right away is that uh, originally you had a multiplication uh, of uh, two, like sum of multiplications of two floating point numbers, and now you have sum of multiplication of two uh, integer numbers quantized by the same dynamic range and uh, you need to somehow uh, uh, output a number which is quantized into a totally different possibly dynamic range which is optimal for uh, this data flow um, which this sum in red here doesn't know about right so something has to take care for this uh, recoding so this uh, 
second part of the hardware need to somehow, in addition to doing the nonlinearity, must also ha somehow recode to the next uh, step. So that's one thing that everyone designing uh, uh, quantized implementation must implement somehow. And uh, of course, there are many other details. For example, what's the representation of the intermediate data and uh, how uh, exactly the pipeline itself, uh, how the arithmetic itself works in, um, in both, uh, both places. So for example, uh, this second part, uh, if it's relevant, it's uh, easy. You just find the sign and you zero it out or not. But if it's a sigmoid or some uh, genuinely nonlinear smooth function that uh, uh, you need to compute it, and uh, you'll probably do it approximately two, right? So there is some approximation there, some trade-off between precision and effort, etc. So there is a lot of details. Uh, so <coughs> if you uh, so, so two people can tell you that they do eight-bit quantization, and they will mean completely different things. Uh, so, for example, one thing that I'd like to focus on is uh, layer-wise or channel-wise quantization. So we talked about uh, the quantization of the weights, right? Finding the dynamic range for the weights, but it can mean two different things. Uh, one, a simple one, is uh, find one dynamic range for the whole matrix, and that's the layer-wise quantization, which means that for each layer you find uh, a different range, obviously, but it's a single uh, dynamic range for uh, all of the parts, the channels of this layer. And, uh, but there is also another part, which is the channel-wise, and it means that for uh, each slice of the weight matrix, which pertains for a certain output channel of this layer, uh, you contact it separately. You find a different dynamic range uh, for it. And of course, uh, is this additional degree of freedom permits you to optimize it uh, a lot more, but it doesn't come uh, freely, right? So it uh, has uh, some cost uh, because uh, because uh, when you uh, decode this weights for the computation, uh, in the point of the computation, you need to know exactly what channel you are. And that's, uh, that uh, complicates the control. doesn't matter if it's a specialized processor of, or GPU or uh, general purpose. It uh, complicates the control in a certain way. Uh, so uh, just uh, to make it uh, even more concrete, uh, the layer-wise quantization, which is what uh, is mostly used, has, uh, uh, has uh, serious pain uh, because of the different dynamic layer, the uh, dynamic ranges of the channels. So what happens is uh, uh, that, uh, in fact, if we compare it to channel-wise quantization, we see that uh, eventually we take the dynamic range of the channels and we like take the union on all of them. So that's an example of different, let's say, channel with uh, the dynamic ranges. And uh, that happens both for weights and the activations. That's another depiction where the x-axis is the channel number and uh, the y-axis is uh, the maximum, the dynamic range uh, on uh, the channel. Um, so for example, this guy uh, suffers a lot because it's uh, quantized according to a much wider dynamic range than he actually used. So it doesn't it, it didn't, doesn't get quantized according to 8 bits, but rather uh, uh, less, and the uh, same for these guys. So we have uh, this gap here, okay, between, for most channels, we have a serious gap between the actual uh, dynamic range that they need and the one uh, actually used to compute the beans and uh, quantize. And, uh, and this creates a, a precision heat. It increases the SQNR. Not to say that this QNR is always the right measure, but uh, in any metric that you take, it increases the uh, the noise with respect to the signal. Uh, so the simplest way to uh, the simplest way to look at it is that some of the channels are just not quantized to eight bits; they are quantized to six bits or five bits. Uh, and it's no fun, right? If we would like to quantize to four bits, maybe we would we would use four-bit hardware and save uh, some more uh, wattage. 
Uh, so, if you remember the mantra, uh, we maybe can do something about it here, right? You have the strong, uh, strong channels and weak channels uh, share uh, the same range. Maybe we can uh, amplify the weak and compress the strong. And we will see how we do exactly that at the end. So, uh, cool. So, now let's talk about uh, optimization. So, just uh, to be on the same page about what it means to quantize without special optimizations, let's talk about that uh, vanilla quantization process. So, uh, let's say you downloaded a, a pre-trained network from the internet, you want to run it on an 8-bit device. Uh, usually what you will do is that you will calibrate, because uh, to quantize the activations you need to sample. Uh, you need to sample it on real data to find the statistics. Uh, and then you will decide on the dynamic ranges. Maybe it will be simple decision according to the maximum value. Or maybe you will take some 99% uh, or whatever, give up some uh, high outliers. Uh, and uh, on the output of the process, uh, you will have obviously the, b the weights you will have them quantized to 8-bit. So uh, the yellow ones are uh, the export, like the outputs of the process. So for data, you can't quantize it uh, before because it's a dynamic quantization, not a static one. But we, you, what you will do is to decide on the parameters of the recoder, which uh, connects, which permits this, uh, this magic of uh, operating of on uh, encoded data, right? So. Uh, Maybe it looks a, bit, a, a little bit uh, simple, but uh, what happens in fact here is that uh, you have encoded data coming in, compressed data coming in, and compressed data coming out, and uh, you never decompress it to full precision inside, the, or you try not to, uh, uh, inside the, this computation. Uh, it does require some tricks uh, sometimes. Uh, but eventually, for uniform quantization, uh, it's uh, simple because uh, the transformation of the encoding is linear, both on the left side here and on the right side. So the recoding is also a linear transformation. Eventually, it's uh, multiplying by some factor. Uh, so once you have this, you can run it on your device or emulator or whatever, and uh, Find uh, your uh, favorite on your this net and on the metric of this net. You can uh, uh, run the original network, the quantized network, and find the difference between the accuracies uh, that you achieve. You will see exactly how the quantized network is uh, less good at uh, recognizing cats, and that's the degradation, not the cats, uh, the <laughs> or the overall uh, metric like top one accuracy is the classic one. Uh, so, for example, for some classic networks, we see that uh, with 8 bits, of course, it depends on, on the number of bits. Uh, you can work with 16 or 4 bits, but for 8 bits, which is the classic case, we have pretty small degradations for ResNet networks, unless they are very big, uh, also for inception. Uh, but uh, for dense net, and especially for mobile nets, uh, you are suffering uh, big degradations on approaching 10% order of magnitude. I'm not sure you see the x-axis here, but 50% accuracy is here and 80 is here. Uh, so uh, uh, for uh, the nets in the lower portion here, you see that some uh, optimization uh, can be really helpful. And that's what we will talk about right now. So. Uh, so that's the like main approaches to optimizing the quantization. The main divide is between uh, uh, techniques which necessitate training, quantization aware training, which uh, eventually, eventually that's the best thing you can do if you have the data set, if the, if the GPU power and the brain power, that's the best thing you can do, right? If you remember at the start, we talked about searching the constrained family of functions. So here, what's uh, 
what do we mean by searching the family of the, the family functions constrained to 8 bits? It's uh, exactly that. Uh, the quantization they were training. So, and the, the other half of the techniques is what's called post training quantization. It's a little bit a soup of words, but uh, what we mean here is that we finish training, we don't train again, we don't have the resources. It's a very relevant practical case. Uh, and then we just make some mathematical tricks uh, to improve the results. So, uh, eventually, most of these are uh, somehow related to dynamic range optimization, the thing that we are talking about all the time. And uh, there are uh, some very famous techniques uh, around pruning and weight sharing and stuff like that. Some people uh, use this to work in four bits. Uh, but most of them are actually belong to another kind of uh, family of methods, which are those that need uh, specialized hardware. So if you remember, we talked about the linearity of all of these operations, uh, which uh, makes it simple to perform uh, mathematics on encoded data without uh, decoding. But if your encoding is not linear, if it's uh, specialized, specially trained, for example, if you have uh, sparsity that you uh, want, uh, sparsity generated by pruning that you want to use, then uh, it, it will it will cost you eventually okay it will cost you uh, some decoding process either in hardware or in software which costs uh, clocks um, and uh, and of course you can uh, the, uh, the other thing that you can do is to start changing the network itself start changing uh, on a larger scale Ch uh, portions of layers split layers add layers uh, etc so uh, let's talk about what we do about stuff. Uh, so we made two uh, contributions which we think are nice, which are uh, located around the landscape, uh, more or less like this. One of them, which we call channel equalization, is uh, completely post-training, and uh, it's uh, mostly about the dynamic range optimization, but uh, it's a uh, it's different what, what, on what most people do. Most people do go about the dynamic range optimization by doing some smarter clipping. So we talked a few times about uh, take, making the dynamic range smaller and giving up on some outliers. Uh, so that's a smart parametric decision that, that you can uh, try to uh, do in uh, certain smart ways, and many people try. But this doesn't uh, necessitate giving up on anything, and that's a little bit of okay. Doesn't mind, uh, and the, the other one is uh, somewhere on the edge between quantization wire training and uh, to see this in effect, we will track down our effort to uh, quantize the mobile net uh, version two, which is a, a quite new and very relevant network uh, by Google, published one year ago, uh, and uh, used extensively in the mobile. Uh, in edge devices. Uh, so the reference by uh, the TF Lite uh, software package by Google, which is uh, maybe the industry leader, um, the package in, uh, about uh, the quantization, at least uh, out of those who publish uh, results, uh, they get to 8% degradation uh, post training and they uh, reduce the 1% degradation when they use the whole data set to train in a quantization aware way. So let's see what we managed to do about it. Uh, so uh, just a reminder for uh, those who are into that stuff, the mobile net architecture is a little bit special because uh, relative to other convolutional nets, it doesn't have this uh, big um, um, four-dimensional kernels but rather it has alternating layers of uh, depth-wise, uh, uh, which are uh, like classic uh, image processing filter acting separately on each channel, like uh, the classic filter acting on red separately and green separately, uh, Gaussian kernels, etc. And uh, uh, alternating with one-on-one uh, -on -one convolutions, which is uh, a uh, smart way to say that uh, each pixel separately, you apply uh, like a fully connected layer, 
you multiply the vector of input channels by a matrix to get the vector of output channels. Uh, and it's a bit harder to quantize than other ones, which is uh, kind of maybe not surprising because it's kind of uh, designed uh, to be compressed uh, in the first place. Uh, okay, so that's our method. It, uh, we think it's nice. It's uh, posted on archive. You can read it and also submit it to the conference. So what it's all about? Uh, the channel equalization, uh, it actually utilizes an uh, interesting and overlooked uh, degree of freedom, which, uh, it, which uh, to, you need to, to understand, you need to look at two subsequent layers. You need to ignore the nonlinear activations for a moment. Uh, and uh, you need to uh, see that it's actually multiplication by two matrices if you ignore the activation. So uh, it's a little bit like uh, multiplying by the first matrix and by the second. It's like multiplying by the uh, multiplications of the matrices. Sorry for the word soup. Uh, and if you take a, a multiplication of two matrices and you take a certain uh, column on the first one, and you multiply it by a factor, and then you, you divide the corresponding row of the sec by, by the same factor. You can do the linear algebra exercise. You will see that nothing will change. Okay, so uh, you can do it. N nobody will notice. It's very funny. Uh, and uh, but that's the reason for the tongue-in-cheek title. Same, same, but different. So. Uh, Nothing will change uh, in the full precision implementation, but uh, but the numeric, uh, but uh, when you look at the numeric implementation, which uh, incurs uh, round num rounded numbers, a lot of things uh, will change. Uh, so uh, we'll to look at the results in a minute, but uh, let's uh, just generalize it a bit. Instead of talking about a single channel, which we multiply by a factor, let's uh, pick, uh, pick uh, one factor for each column. Okay, so for each column here and corresponding row here, we'll pick a different factor, multiply it, perform these operations uh, all, all at once. And uh, sorry for the math, but it eventually it's equivalent to inserting uh, a diagonal matrix and its inverse to the first and to the second. And of course, uh, the, the result uh, will not change. And uh, if you remember, I asked you to ignore the activation for a moment. And uh, indeed, activation may be a problem in the general case, but in most convolutional networks, uh, the activation is uh, for example, Rayleigh or Leakey Rayleigh, it can be described as multiplication by a global factor, which it de is depend dependent only on sign of the data. So it's piecewise multiplication, piece two piece multiplication. So since this transformation doesn't change the sign, then the activation is also transparent. Okay, so it's not completely multiplication of matrices, but it's multiplication of matrices with something in the middle, which is transparent through it and if you look at the formula, you can see that it can be moved and, uh, and then removed. Okay, so what is it good for? Yep. No question. Uh, so uh, when you have a residual addition, for example, in Mobile 2.0 resonance, it terminates this process, right? You cannot carry on if you have an addition in the so that's a special case, right? Yeah, there, there are certain special cases. In MobileNet, there is another problem, which is the ReLU6 activation. It doesn't exactly conform to this formula, and we have special tricks for this. So we can talk to Eldad or uh, any of us after the lecture. Uh, and of course, read the paper. Uh, so this is a degree of freedom, which is a kind of resource, right? Instead of one solution, we see that we have an equivalent family of solutions, which is equivalent in the full precision space, but maybe some of them will be more uh, 
suitable to uh, quantization. Uh, okay, so let's recall our problem. Uh, so our problem was that uh, the ranges of the different channels were different. But now uh, we have a degree of freedom, we have a superpower, right? The superpower is that we can uh, uh, multiply uh, by factors different channels, by different factors. Uh, and then we can uh, uh, fight this gap, amplify the weak, compress the strong, and long live the revolution. Uh, so, uh, uh, so uh, what we what, what we can do is, uh, if you look at the difference between two, these two pictures, uh, that uh, we can take these little channels and for for these channels. Uh, pick up large factors, or equivalently, uh, and that's some details, take the big channels and pick small factors for them. And uh, it sounds, it may, be, may, may sound like a free lunch to you, but it's not completely that, because of course you need to compensate it on the next layer. So theoretically, uh, sure I can uh, equalize, uh, absolute, uh, equalize all of these to the same uh, dynamic range, but uh, then I may harm the next layer. And it, it didn't happen, but uh, eventually after, and also there are some additional complications, you have the activations and the weights. Uh, so we talked about weights, but when you multiply by a factor, the weights, then the activations of the same channels are uh, also multiplied because uh, the weights contribute to them. Uh, so, but eventually if you do it in a smart way, and I encourage you to read the papers uh, to see all of Eldad's uh, tricks. Uh, then uh, the benefit that uh, you make to the current layer is more than the harm that you do uh, to the next layer. And of course, what you can uh, do next is to iterate, right? So you take layers one and two, look at them as a pair, uh, perform this trick, and then layer one is fixed, layer two is uh, harmed just a little bit. And uh, then you uh, look at uh, layer two and three as a pair, and uh, etc. You iterate, and uh, you get uh, very, very nice results. I'll spare you the details. Uh, uh, on most net, on all nets actually, except of mobile net, at least for the image net task and for the classic networks, this method alone is enough to uh, get. Uh, well below 1% degradation. Uh, and for mobile nets, it gets to uh, 2%, which is also decent. But uh, let's wait and see what happens after we add the second optimizer. So uh, this one in the works, it's not uh, a conference grade, but uh, we'll post some uh, report and archive soon, we hope so. So uh, eventually, if you, if you remember, we draw some histograms uh, for activations of a layer. Uh, once we do some quantization, it's also interesting to draw histograms of the original network, of uh, activations of some layer in the original networks, and in the quantized network. And, and if you do it, sometimes you see a picture like this, uh, where the histograms are, uh, the quantized net histogram is, uh, of course, has different shape and it's uh, noisy, etc. but it's also actually shifted. Uh, as a serious DC shift, and uh, there are certain reasons for this, but uh, one uh, very simple and nice mechanism that happens a lot in mobile nets is that uh, uh, in the depth-wise layers, the kernels are very small, and then when you plot their original and quantized values on a scatter plot, you could see that sometimes most of them happen to be rounded down and only a bit are rounded up uh, or uh, vice versa and the uh, low of large number low of large numbers fail and uh, this vector of errors has a non zero uh, mean okay so the errors in the weights have non zero mean it multiplies the activations and the, uh, on the input which uh, are all positive because they are outputs of the rel function and you, uh, you got this shifted picture at the output so uh, so so when you look at this you see that uh, 
uh, the, the error has a kind of DC, con DC contribution to it. So uh, let's take a, of course I picked up a layer which is especially prominent in this respect. So uh, I apologize again for the formula, but in fact, if uh, there is one formula that is, uh, you need to remember uh, in the middle of a night, if you're uh, <laughs> a machine learning engineer or data scientist, it's this one, right? Uh, the mean square error, you can uh, decompose it as the square uh, of the mean error and the variance. And uh, for uh, some layers, uh, if you look at many channels, and here the channels are on the axis X, and for each channel we depict like the norm of the signal, the norm of activations over all pixels. And uh, you look at the error, uh, which uh, error here is of course the quantization error, the difference between the same uh, data that flows in the original network and in the quantized network. And uh, you look at the norm of this uh, error vector and the, the mean of this error vector. Uh, you see that the contribution of the mean to the overall magnitude is uh, very significant. Uh, and what's nice about it is that it can uh, it actually um, calls for a reduction, calls for a fixing mechanism. Because uh, what I never told you before in this presentation that we have not only activation and the weights, you have also the biases, right? Like the weights of the constant uh, activation. Uh, and uh, the biases are exactly the right point computationally to compensate for this uh, DC shift. Okay, so uh, let's say the red one is the quantized net, is the, the one with the Q. And if we choose the B fix, I hope you see the formula, to be exactly equal to the difference that we can estimate from these uh, distributions, then <coughs> when we fix the bias in this way, the whole uh, distribution uh, of the quantized net will be shifted to be, be exactly on the histogram of the original one. So uh, that's the issue and uh, the general method, but we can uh, find it in uh, two ways. So one way to approach it is exactly that, is to uh, estimate it directly, uh, sample, uh, sample the data, find the distributions, uh, find the fix, and fix it. And there are some complications we can, which we can solve with a certain uh, iteration trick that you can uh, talk with uh, Uri about uh, later. Um, it's not uh, as easy as you think, uh, uh, but it works, it gives nice results. And uh, the other approach is to say, well, I, I know what I, uh, what I can change. Uh, I, I know that it, uh, it will help. So uh, why not uh, use the best optimizer I can find to find the correct values for uh, this variable? And in this context of uh, neural nets, of course, the best optimizer is the same one that we use for training, which is the uh, propagation and stochastic gradient descent. So a lot of people do, uh, some people did knowledge distillation to improve uh, quantized nets, where the original net is used as a teacher. Usually, uh, of course, they train uh, all of the quantize the uh, biases and weights. Here we suggest uh, like a micro variant of this where we train only the biases to uh, optimize, optimize uh, these fixes, but uh, like in a smarter way. And uh, I, I would like to relate it to the, what I talked about it with respect to sensitivity of the consumer of the signal. Uh, to errors. So uh, in neural network, we don't really know exactly to what uh, the, the downstream uh, part with respect to a certain layer is sensitive. Uh, we see here uh, DC errors and AC errors, but we don't exactly know uh, which one is uh, most uh, detrimental. And then consumer must decide. And the, the best way, in this case, the way for the consumer to decide 
is to take the loss, take the final accuracy and back propagate it back and uh, optimize. So just it's an interesting way to think about it, like the analog of uh, researching uh, your eyes and ears uh, sensitivities to uh, different signals and their errors. The analog here is to uh, optimize the eventual loss of the network with respect uh, to, the, to our fixes. Uh, and uh, and uh, on the practical side, no, not only that uh, we, uh, since we optimize only a small part of the variables, in practice we see that we need a laughable amount of images with respect uh, to a process which is a kind of training. Uh, we even don't need labels, we can like ch ch take uh, a few thousand of images where which, uh, which uh, a bit resemble the data set and uh, it will work. Uh, and uh, when we compare it to the literature, so of course we would like to uh, uh, compete in the uh, lighter category, right? To be Roshel uh, Shualim. So, uh, and uh, our reason for that is the, 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 it's not really training because the, number of images used, it's so small. But another interpretation is that, it's, like I said, it's a very low-hanging fruit of quantization that we're training, uh, which is the, nothing conceptually novel, but it's a very nice uh, take, uh, at least we think. So, okay, let's, uh, let's look at the results. Uh, eventually, these two are... Uh, there is no uh, Kefel Mifzaim uh, perfect, but uh, they do uh, manage to find uh, different tweaks uh, to add uh, one on top of another. So when applied alone, uh, this one gets to 2% degradation, this one gets to 1.5. When applied together, they get to uh, 0.6 degradation, which we think is uh, pretty impressive considering that uh, the Google Fox got to 1% degradation with fully blown quantization aware training of all the weights of the network. Uh, so we think it's nice. And uh, okay, so let's conclude. Let's conclude. Uh, so I uh, hope uh, uh, everyone agrees that uh, quantized neural network are the future. Uh, Actually, maybe the best argument is this. You can see that even the most challenging networks, eventually with enough tricks, we managed to run it in 8 bits almost without degradation. And uh, for other, it's uh, possible to go down to 4 bits. Uh, and uh, so it's possible to run without degradation and with great economy in terms of uh, resources. Um, so uh, certain stuff that we learned in signal processing courses are uh, still relevant, which is uh, good news. Uh, we can uh, still uh, use it to uh, improve uh, certain stuff in uh, neural networks. Uh, the general wisdom of amplifying weak signals, compressing the strong ones, and researching the sensitivities of the downstream consumer of the signal still apply here. And, uh, well, I hope uh, we also convinced you that we developed some uh, nice stuff here, both in terms of uh, the practical results and of uh, some insights uh, gathered along the way, which possibly may be applied even beyond quantization. And thank you all for every bit of your attention. <laughs>